This week, I'd like to address two pieces of subscriber feedback. First, yeah, genealogical stories are often really sad. The world can be a harsh, cold, cruel place. Besides being born and dying, some of the records we leave behind are joyous events, like marriages and having children. But sometimes those records include divorces reported on the front page of small town newspapers, tragic deaths during flu or cholera pandemics, or being the victim of or even committing a crime. So here's genealogy lesson number 11. Celebrate and document the accomplishments of your family members. Be sure to record the joyous events of the lives of your family members for future generations. Tragedies tend to be well documented by newspapers and court records. Some events in your ancestors' lives may have been significant to them, but the importance to others may need the benefit of time. Here's an example. My dad was the first wrestler from his high school to win a match at the state wrestling tournament. He didn't come home a champion, but that win was the beginning of a 75-year sports legacy at his alma mater. Mention of it recently appeared in a book about that high school's wrestling and football histories. My dad often talked about wrestling at the state meet, but I don't know if he realized he made history that day. And I know for sure that he could never have imagined that the family wrestling tradition would continue today with his great-granddaughters grappling. One of the best ways to record joyous events is through photographs. So here's genealogy lesson number 12. Establish a tradition of taking photographs. I recently attended a family reunion. My father's siblings had a tradition of always taking a photo whenever they were gathered together. What was once 11 is now down to just two and the pair was sure to take that photo. In addition to sibling photos, take multi-generational photographs. As I have referenced here previously, the four-generation photograph of Henry Charles Hiscox, his son, his granddaughter, and his great-grandson was a key piece of information informing four generations of my family tree. Print those pictures out. That paper will last for generations, Write the names of people in the photo on the back in pencil using block printed letters, not cursive handwriting. Identify people from left to right and front to back. Also include information about the relationships between the people. Who is whose father? Who is whose daughter? Etc. And if you are not going to frame them, storing them in an acid-free box is okay and sometimes preferred. Adhesives off-gas and destroy photos. So a pile of photos in a shoebox will survive much longer than those glued in a photo album. And a pile of loose photos can be passed around a table of people as you share memories. Only one person at a time can really look at a photo album. Also, scan historical photos and save them for yourself to a cloud account and a piece of external hardware that will stand the test of time. A USB-based device like a flash drive or an external hard drive is probably the most universal at this point. And the thing I have certainly learned is that a photo uploaded to a site like Ancestry.com or Family Search will help your distant cousins make connections to their family. I have been eternally grateful to them because I put faces to names nearly every day in my work. Storing photos is a bit of a crapshoot. My aunt just shared this Polaroid photo taken in 1975. Have you ever seen a Polaroid photo with color this vibrant? I certainly hadn't. I'm not sure how it was stored other than it had never been stuck into a photo album. So remember, Adhesives are bad. It is unknown how plastics will react with photos in the long term. Your storage place should be clean, dry, and cool. And bug-free. I 
also received some feedback regarding the family tree. I know that I talked about how genealogical research goes from the known to the unknown, but the stories I have been telling are from the mid-19th century, and the path back in time may have been confusing. So let's review the family tree with some visuals. So there's this group of 11 siblings. Their father was Robert Hupson Hiscox, who was born in 1906, the son of immigrants, so he was a first-generation American. He passed from cancer in 1953. His father was Robert Upson Hiscox. The elder Robert was born in England in 1878. This Robert immigrated to America in 1902, just a few weeks after returning home to Wales following serving in the Boer War. He died during the flu pandemic in 1918. His father was Henry William Hiscox, who was born in London in 1839 and grew up in the Royal Mews at Buckingham Palace. Henry William worked for the royal family as a weekly employee from the age of 13 to 24. Although it seems he was on the list of weekly workers at the age of 13, he didn't really start working regularly until he was 18. Later, he becomes a farmer in Cheshire County in northwest England and marries a local young woman. He sent his sons to America to buy land. Four of his sons and one of his daughters permanently immigrated to the United States. He and his eldest daughter leave Wales and take an extended visit to America prior to and during World War I, but they both move back to England after the war. Henry William passes in England in 1928. His father was Henry Charles Hiscox, who was born in Froome, Somerset in 1815. He died in Braintree, Essex in 1902. He worked as the messenger for the Master of the Horse at Buckingham Palace for more than 40 years. He is the guy who did something very important with the Queen's horses, according to family lore and surely played his cards right to put his son Henry William on the list of weekly employees in the Master of the Horse Department. This ensured that his oldest son had an opportunity for a good, steady job. This brings me to genealogy lesson number 13. Family lore usually contains a grain of truth. So, My family's lore was that someone had done something very important with the queen's horses. But the reality was that my three-times great-grandfather and my two-times great-grandfather both worked for the master of the horse department at Buckingham Palace, and the whole family lived at the Royal Mews. So in England, a mews traditionally housed horses and had rooms above, I haven't visited the Royal Mews at Buckingham Palace, and I don't know how they were constructed or if the servants' residential quarters are still there. But if anybody visits, please ask where the servants lived in the 19th century. And if the quarters still exist, let us know in the comments. But back to the history about family lore. I've known for several years that Henry Charles was the messenger for the Master of the Horse at Buckingham Palace. But I discovered a few weeks ago, by complete accident that his son Henry William worked there as well. I noticed that some Buckingham Palace employee records said H.W. Hiscox rather than H.H.C. or Henry Charles. A little more digging unveiled the entire story. In my defense, there were more than 40 years of quarterly records, so no wonder I missed it previously. But thorough research is the mark of reliable genealogy and part of what is called the genealogical proof standard, which we'll talk about more in depth in a future video. But don't just stop looking because you think you solved the family mystery, as there may be much more to the story. Okay, back to the family tree. There are 11 siblings whose father was Robert Hupson Hiscox, whose father was Robert Upson Hiscox, whose father was Henry William Hiscox, whose father was Henry Charles Hiscox, whose father was Charles Hiscox. 
Charles was born in about 1783. He married Elizabeth Pierce in 1803 and had many children. I think those children are Richard, Thomas, John, Martha, Anne Elizabeth, Henry Charles, Stephen James, Sarah Whitchurch, and Marianne. I decided to dive into researching these siblings because I thought it would help me definitively determine who all the siblings were, their life stories, and the life story of Charles and Elizabeth, and even identifying previous generations. Because at least seven of these nine siblings leave Froome. Somerset and Wiltshire seem to have been the home of the Hiscox family for generations, and I think I'm getting closer to discovering why these siblings up and moved to London. Perhaps the reasons weren't all that different as to why most of Henry Williams' children up and moved to America. Opportunity. And perhaps part of the reason was necessity, as it seems Charles Hiscox had passed away by 1828, just five years after his youngest daughter was born. The National Death Registry didn't start until 1837 in the UK, However, deaths were recorded in local churches, and I'm still searching for that record. I promised my next episode will be about Martha's son, Charles Cater, and his success in the rag trade, and his connection to Cheshire, which is where we know his cousin Henry William Hiscox moved after he left Buckingham Palace. Until next time, this has been Spinster Aunt. 